Good evening, everyone, um, and good evening to our distinguished guests this evening. Uh, my name is Fiona Jenkins. I'm the convener of the ANU Gender Institute, and it's a great pleasure to welcome you all to the launch of Reading the Room. Honestly, making this podcast has been one of the real joys of 2021, a wonderful thing to do during difficult months of lockdown. And it's brought together students, academics, alumni, and leaders of the Australian National University to read aloud together Virginia Woolf's classic feminist text, A Room of One's Own. Before we go any further, I wish first to acknowledge the Ngunnawal and Ngambri people who are the traditional custodians of the land upon which I'm meeting with you today and many others of you will be here in Canberra too. And I want to pay my respects to elders past and present. We also acknowledge and celebrate the first Australians upon whose traditional lands we've been recording this podcast across Australia, and we pay our respect to their elders. We acknowledge also that this land was never ceded. We would also like to acknowledge First Nations people everywhere who may be attending this launch. I'm gonna be hosting you tonight together with one of my co-producers on this project, Lara Nichols. And she's the inaugural Jennifer Strauss Fellow in the Humanities and a PhD candidate in the ANU Centre for Art History and Art Theory. And along with Ivana Ho, who's a member of the College of Arts and Social Sciences media team and is our third producer on this project, we would like to thank all our incredible readers, um, many of whom are with us tonight. And um, it's been absolutely wonderful working with um, all of you. Now, before we turn to our panel discussion of the podcast, it's a very great pleasure to welcome and introduce um, our very special guest this evening who's joining us from Brisbane. We're honoured to have Dame Quentin Bryce with us to formally launch uh, the podcast Reading the Room. Of course, as you'll all know, uh, Quentin was Australia's first female Governor General, um, the highest office in the land. And before her appointment in 2008, she had a very distinguished career in the law and in public office, and throughout her life has been a staunch advocate for the rights of women and girls. Indeed, she did us the very great honor of launching the Gender Institute uh, just a little over 10 years ago now. Since leaving the office of Governor General, she has continued to work quite tirelessly, for instance, chairing Queensland's Special Task Force on Domestic and Family Violence, which produced the Not Now, Not Ever report, which made very important evidence-based recommendations for putting an end to domestic and family violence. So may I now warmly invite you, um, Quentin, to formally launch the ANU podcast, Reading the Room. Please join me, everyone, in, in welcoming Quentin. Thank you, Fiona. Good evening, my friends. I want you to know how delighted I am to welcome you, uh, to join you. I remember with affection, Fiona, when I launched the Gender Institute on International Women's Day, it was 2011, and there were purple, green and white balloons everywhere. It was truly a gorgeous, sparkling occasion. Reading the Room is a wonderful collaboration, bringing together so many remarkable people. Congratulations to producers of this inspiring project, Fiona, Lara Nichols and Ivana Ho. The brilliant idea to record a collection of voices reading out loud Virginia Woolf's A Room of One's Own came to Lara during the first lockdown in 2020 when she was living at ANU's Bergman College. The community grounded in their rooms for weeks. She joined forces with Fiona at an arts and social sciences dinner and with the support of the Institute and the College of Arts and Social Sciences, that idea has been translated into reality. Recordings were made with Ivana Ho's media expertise in rooms and gardens uh, across Canberra in its most recent lockdown. The podcast we are launching tonight assembles a variety of voices. The text they read leads us to a quietness, to deep thought, deep reflection. My treasured years as principal of the Women's College at Sydney Uni taught me how influential and inspiring college life is. Women's colleges, by their very nature, are pioneering it's not surprising that A Room of One's Own was born of Wolf's experience of giving two lectures on women and fiction to the first women's colleges in Cambridge in 1928. 
It was only 50 years earlier that women had been admitted to Cambridge and Oxford. While the University of London awarded women degrees from 1870, Cambridge didn't confer any on women until 1948. This is precisely why projects like Reading the Room are important. It gives hope in challenging days, inviting a new community to gather to continue the work of reformist women of the 1870s who opened up education, the key, the key to everything, to income security, to good health, to a fulfilling life. When Wolfe arrived at Girton College, Cambridge, she remarked on the impoverishment of the women's colleges in contrast to the wealth and the splendour of the men's, many of them established 400 years earlier. She had an epiphany of sorts when she realised that the women who built Girton and Newnham had no traditions to draw on, nor the centuries of capital accruing from old boys' endowments of lectures. Uh, lectureships, fellowships, laboratories. Women had to raise enough money to buy the land, build a college from scratch in circumstances where few people really wanted women to be educated. Very few women controlled financial resources of their own. It's this institutional resistance to women's independence, citizenship and professionalisation that is the core subject of a room of one's own. It was no coincidence that when Wolfe wrote the book, British women over 21 had only just been granted the vote in 1928. Australian women had become the envy of the world when the Commonwealth Franchise Act gave them the vote in 1902. Wolfe makes an interesting analysis of these political freedoms, deciding that they're not as nearly as valuable as economic independence. Her view is that the money a woman earns and owns and the security of a room of one's own is far more important than the vote. Despite the long years of feminist work leading to the vote, Wolf laments, too little else has changed. She observes only the acts of men make the news and pointedly remarks that the most transient visitor to this planet who picked up this paper could not fail to be aware that England is under the rule of a patriarchy. Of course, we hope we do not have to choose between having the vote and having economic security. Nonetheless, like Virginia Woolf in 1928, weighing up the contrasting economic position of men and women, we too may today feel that not enough progress has been made. We read the hideous statistics of domestic violence, of se sexual harassment, and the persistent gender pay gap, and observe that so often women's employment is still underpaid, insecure, and increasingly casualised. And we see First Nations women and women of colour everywhere facing extra burdens of discrimination. We hear that older women are becoming the fastest growing category of homeless people. This is unjust, it's unfair, and it's unacceptable. Yet Wolf writes that even in poverty and obscurity, it is worth the while to keep working away because eventually the change and the reform that we imagine will become real. This is precisely why projects such as Reading the Room are so powerful, so empowering. This project invites a new community to come together and continue for our own times the work of reformist women of the 1870s who established women's colleges and opened education and other opportunities for women. My friends, we need a wider range of voices in the debate. We need a broader ambition to listen to all women. Feminism, can only prosper if its achievements are relevant to women of all socioeconomic classes, all cultural backgrounds. Men and women of many different backgrounds read aloud in this project. I'm delighted that the producers engage trailblazing feminist leaders to participate. Listening to our first woman Prime Minister, the Honourable Julie Gillard, 
read the historic first pages, that great line, a woman must have money and a room of her own if she is to write fiction, is deeply touching. Contributors include Elizabeth Reed, Australia's first advisor to a Prime Minister on Women's Affairs, Distinguished Professor Hilary Charlesworth, recently appointed to the International Court of Justice, the fifth woman in its history and the first Australian woman. I enjoyed hearing the familiar voice of Vice-Chancellor, esteemed astrophysicist and Nobel Prize winner, Professor Brian Schmidt, read Wolf's piercing questions. Why was one sex so prosperous and the other so poor? What conditions are necessary for the creation of works of art? Both questions that in some version or other, feminist scholars today are still asking and researching. My friends, I wish the Australian National University glittering success with this project, Reading the Room, Virginia Woolf's superb prose, evocative descriptions and intelligent polemic are utterly, utterly essential reading. Fiona, to you, to Ivana and uh, Lara, thank you for this gift. Thank you. Thank you so much, Quentin, for those very generous reflections and, and indeed for the passionate feminism that you, that you bring to um, this whole uh, set of problems and questions and all the wonderful contributions you've made in that way during the years. Um, we're very grateful for you to come and join us this evening. I hope you'll be able to stay now for the panel yes. discussion um, and uh, maybe pose a question yourself. Um, mm -hmm. But for now, let me hand back to um, Lara uh, to make your introductions to um, the project and the panel. Thank you. Thank you very much, Fiona, and, and thank you, Dame Quentin, for your inspiring and enlightening and kind remarks about our project. It's really wonderful to hear um, such affirmation from you. Um, I might add also that while the project did start its life as a sort of a, an idea in a college room, it has been a fabulous collaboration. I really want to thank Fiona and the Gender Institute for taking the idea and running with it. And of course, to our other co-producer, Ivana Ho, it's just been fabulous working with you and with the whole of the Australian National University. Um, now, before I introduce our remarkable panellists, I have a, a little surprise for you, which Fiona alluded to, which is we're going to play um, those wonderful strident opening paragraphs from A Room of One's Own, read by our first female Prime Minister, the Honourable Julia Gillard. So bear with me for one moment while I set that up and um, we'll, it should take no time at all. But you may say, we asked you to speak about women and fiction. What has that got to do with a room of one's own? I will try to explain. When you asked me to speak about women and fiction, I sat down on the banks of a river and began to wonder what the words meant. They might mean simply a few remarks about Fanny Burney, a few more about Jane Austen, a tribute to the Brontes and a sketch of Hamworth Parsonage under snow. Some witticisms, if possible, about Miss Mitford, a respectful allusion to George Eliot, a reference to Mrs Gaskell, and one would have done. But at second sight, the word seemed not so simple. The title, Women and Fiction Might Mean, and you may have meant it to mean, women and what they are like. Or it might mean women and the fiction that they write or it might mean women and the fiction that is written about them, or it might mean that somehow all three are inextricably mixed together and you want me to consider them in that light. But when I began to consider the subject in this last way, which seemed the most interesting, I soon saw that it had one fatal drawback. I should never be able to come to a conclusion. I should never be able to fulfil what is, I understand, the first duty of a lecturer, to hand you, after an hour's discourse, a nugget of pure truth, to wrap up between the pages of your notebooks and keep on the mantelpiece forever. All I could do was to offer you an opinion 
upon one minor point. A woman must have money and a room of her own if she is to write fiction. And that, as you will see, leaves the great problem of the true nature of woman and the true nature of fiction unsolved. Well, what a wonderful um, reading and what an extraordinary passage. That is, that, that's the opening of the book, <laughs> to put it into perspective. Um, I also would like to add um, and acknowledge that wonderful music that's accompanying um, our podcast, which you heard there, um, which has been so expertly integrated by Ivana Ho. Um, it is actually the string quartet in E minor composed in 1912 by Dame Ethel Smythe. And Dame Ethel Smythe was a great friend of Virginia Woolf. They had a historic meeting together, which is very funny to read about. Um, and indeed, they wrote to each other for a number of years, and those letters are scintillating reading, I must admit. Um, so it is a special thanks to um, Odeline de Martinez from Lontano Records, um, who granted us permission um, kindly to use this music featured throughout the podcast. Odeline herself is a pioneering woman of music, um, and she was, in fact, the first female conductor of the BBC's very famous prom promenade concerts. And now to our eagerly waited panel discussion, we have four remarkable panellists tonight who are joining us to take up some of Wolf's great provocations um, and um, share their reflections also on reading this book. And three of our panellists have in fact read for the project, which is exciting. Um, now, first of all, we have Professor Rosie Campbell joining us from London. She is the inaugural director of the Global Institute for Women's Leadership um, at the King's College in London, which, of course, is now affiliated with the Australian National University. That was quite a coup for us, I think. Um, Rosie is a political scientist who focuses on the political position of political position of women within democracy. And her latest publication, I think you'll like the title of it, um, The Gendered Harassment of Parliamentary Candidates in the UK. I think we all need to read that. Um, and Women Voters Taking the Wheel. Um, both give you a clear indication of the type of scholarship that um, Professor Campbell is engaged with. Um, we are also delighted to be joined by Professor Kate Mitchell, who has just recently been appointed the Director of the Research School of Humanities and the Arts at ANU. Hello, Kate. Um, it's a role that she commences very soon in January 2022. Now, Kate is a literary scholar, so very important to have a literary scholar on our panel, um, and her research is highly re relevant to our topic because it's focused on 19th and 20th century literary and cultural history, um, and she has a particular interest in neo-Victorian fiction and historical um, the historical recollection of fictional narratives. Hello, Kate. And we are also delighted to be joined by Dr. Rehan Ismail, who is a DECRA fellow and a senior lecturer in this, at the Centre for um, Arab and Islamic Studies at ANU. Hello, Rehan. Um, she has researched widely and published um, significant texts on politics, religion and the role of women in society in the Arab world. Welcome, Rehan. And finally, our student representative, we are a university and we have many undergraduates, so it's great that we have Mr. Ben Jefferson to join us. Um, ben was the previous um, president of the Bergman College Residents Association, um, and he's currently studying economics and philosophy at ANU. Um, and as a student leader in 2020, Ben had to lead the college cohort um, through the devastation of a pandemic. And I think you're probably among the first group of um, a college um, presidents having to lead a, a college through a pandemic. So well done for that. Um, and for those of you in our audience who would have questions that you would like to ask of our panellists, and I'm sure there are many, um, can you please just um, put your questions into the Q&A function at the bottom of your screen? And Fiona and I will, um, will ask those questions for you on your behalf. Now, I'm very excited because I get to ask the first question tonight, um, and I'm going to ask a question of Kate Mitchell, um, because I think it's important that we contextualise this book um, for us. Um, Kate, at the time that this book was published in 1929, A Room of One's Own was considered very much a radical text in terms of both its content about um, the discrimination against women and also its, its um, literary modernist form. Um, can you contextualise this book for us at the time in terms of the new literature that was emerging then and also in terms of the Bloomsbury Group's um, desire to break with, with, the, um, with the past? Thanks, Larry. Yes, of course, um, by 1929 when Wolf uh, published 
uh, this essay. She was al already really well known as a novelist. And in fact, many of the novels um, that we still sort of study and know of hers today, To the Lighthouse, Jacob's Room, Mrs. Dalloway, were all published in that um, decade of the 1920s, which was a really important um, decade for literature and for a particular shift in literature, um, that breaking with the past that you're talking about. Um, so I think sometimes if the essay is sometimes a bit disorienting to read and so on, or it has a surprising form, um, it's partly because that form kind of matches and supports or underpins its radical politics. So Wolf and um, the fellow group of writers that you're you mentioned Lara, the Blooms, Bloomsbury group, as well as a range of other writers that we now associate with modernism in this early 20th century period, understood themselves to be living in a time of really radical change um, when the kind of morality, the certainties, the sureties that their Victorian um, parents had sort of held to um, when these certainties were kind of eroding or rapidly disintegrating as a result of things like sweeping technological advances, uh, the experience of many more people living in these massive cities, um, industrialised cities, people starting to work on, um, you know, production lines in factories and so on, but also things like uh, changes to laws around voting, as, we, as we've heard, but divorcing the ownership of property uh, and so on. There was a sense among this group of writers that there'd been this kind of historical rupture um, and that the kind of rigid social gender ideals, class ideals, all seemed kind of outmoded ways of organising social relations. And of course, in the years, um, the sort of decade or two immediately before this, World War I had only served to heighten that sense of rupture and a kind of break uh, with what had been before. So in their writing, Wolf uh, and other modernist writers, artists too, sought new ways to represent this kind of new experience, the sort of tumult of modernity, um, if you like, a new way to authentically represent this sense that human consciousness had somehow changed. Um, Ezra Pound, very famous modernist writer, um, had a sort of dictum that was make, make it new. Um, and I think that that kind of underpins uh, the modernist sort of um, approach. So in poetry, you see uh, lots of poets writing in free verse, so um, kind of abandoning that sort of stricter, more controlled, um, you know, iambic pentameter, all the sort of structured uh, rhyming schemes. Um, and in fact, the narrator in A Room of One's Own makes a kind of dig at this um, in that lovely passage where she can kind of quote at length um, these stanzas by Tennyson and Dickinson, both 19th century uh, poets, but then sort of says, you can't remember more than a line or two <laughs> of uh, the new modern poets because they've abandoned they, those kind of memorable rhyming schemes. But that sense of casting off the old um, for a new freedom to be able to range freely uh, through free verse. In prose, writers like Wolf are attempting to represent human consciousness more authentically than the sort of more traditional realist forms of the novel could do. They were seeking what um, came to be sort of known as a kind of psychological realism. So one of the things that many readers first notice on opening a novel by Wolf, or in fact her essay that we're looking at today, is that rather than that kind of nice orienting introduction that um, an Austen narrator might give, um, you know, that sort of you know, draws the reader into the text softly, we begin very quickly in modernist novels to be thrust immediately into the action or often into the kind of psychology of a character. Um, and Wolf uses this technique to strong effect uh, in A Room of One's Own, I think. As we just heard, it begins in what we call in media res, in the midst of things. Um, but you may say, we asked you to speak about women and fiction. We're sort of thrust straight in as though, you know, there's been this kind of question um, off stage, if you like. And rather than offer a sure-footed narrator whose controlling perspective kind of guides us through the text and is a sort of moral centre for the text, 
A room of one's own deploys a narrative device very common in modernist fiction called stream of consciousness, um, where we burrow deeply into the mind of the narrator and we kind of just follow the associative leaps that her mind makes. We follow her train of thought without any kind of outside perspective. Now, Wolf puts this technique to excellent effect for her argument because as the narrator's train of thought is disrupted by the kind of daily affairs <laughs> that she encounters, we experience that sense of interruption and that sense of a thought disrupted uh, along with her. So there's lots of examples we could um, point to like this where the radical narrative techniques of the essay support and even somehow kind of enact the argument that the essay itself makes. And these are all techniques drawn from modernist fiction. Wow, thank you for those remarks, Kate. I, I really I ask you lots of things, but we're <laughs> going to move on, save that for the end. Um, Rosa, let me turn to you. So one of the one of the things about this text, of course, is it, you know, it's incredible contemporary relevance in, in so many ways. And I wanted to take you back to this um, line that we've quoted several times already of the two, the vote and the money, the money I own seem infinitely the more important. And I think it's such a provocative um, line um, because, of course, we think of the vote of, as, the, as the, the achievement and she's really drawing attention to the other sort of questions that are still with us. Um, so how would you rate the relative importance of economic versus political uh, equality for women and, and can they be separated at all? I mean, it's a really challenging question and we know that women around, women and girls around the world are economically disadvantaged compared to men still and that's true in, in long established democracies that we have, although we, we've had the right to vote for a long time, we don't have the same level of economic empowerment and if we look around the world at the world's richest people, they are almost entirely men with one or two exceptions. Um, but, and I think it's a, a big but, you can't protect your economic freedom or try to establish it without political rights. And I think if we look at what's happening in Afghanistan at the moment, I mean, that rings, you know, it's, it's, it's so true. And that we have to fight for our political rights in order to be able to begin to try and enhance our economic freedoms. So I think the two things are inextricably linked, but I think one of the issues is that get the, getting the vote doesn't automatically then create economic empowerment. There's an awful lot more that we have to do. And if we think about getting the vote, that's one stage, getting women elected, getting women elected into powerful positions, getting enough women elected that can bring about a change, electing the right women, electing women who've had experience of living in poverty, diverse women. It's, you know, it, there's a lot of stages to go through, but I do think they're, in, they are, they're absolutely inextricably linked. Thank you. That's a, that's a terrific answer for us to think further with. Um, Rehan, I'd like to turn to you and ask you for your take on Wolf's feminism, because, of course, she's writing as a very um, privileged middle class white woman of the metropole. Um, her approach to questions of inequality is shaped by that. There's, some, there's something almost, you know, so obvious about that in talking about a room of one's own and how one has to have such a thing. How well do you think her descriptions travel and, and do you think that the concerns that she raises also speak to areas of the Arabic speaking world where you've studied and, and the women's political struggles there? Yeah, um, thank you. First of all, I want to say thank you so much, Fiona, Lara and Ivana for having me on board. Um, it is wonderful actually to be part of this project. Um, I would say again that that is a, a great question, Fiona. Um, when I read um, Wolf's feminism, and it seems that, you know, she emphasizes societal and structural limitations as barriers to women's empowerment and equality. Um, her literary work captures her critical assessment of the need for women to access education and to have financial stability. And she highlights the intellectual respect that women deserve and asserts the need for equal opportunities to maximize women's potential. Um, I actually love her construct of Shakespeare's sister as a fictional character. I thought that was really fascinating. Um, and to answer your question, I would say that her descriptions are universal. Women in the global south have suffered a similar predicament as well. Um, many struggled for equality and fought for the right to education and for their 
uh, emancipation from the constraints of patriarchy at home. And we know from India to Iraq uh, to Egypt, uh, female poets and writers, often of aristocratic backgrounds, wrote um, against the patriarchy in their countries in the 19th and 20th centuries. Um, Arab feminists uh, shared the same concerns with highlights in her work. Uh, the importance of education for girls was propagated by Arab feminists. But one thing I would say is that her, uh, Virginia Woolf's feminism was also shaped, as you've mentioned, Fiona, by her relative privilege, um, as her struggle was against men in society who overlooked women's contributions and limited opportunities for them. Um, the women in the Global South at the time were struggling on two fronts. Uh, first, against uh, patriarchy at home. Second, colonialism. Um, the oppressive nature, oppressive nature of colonialism was the main preoccupation of these women. And to them, true emancipation can only materialize with the end of colonial subjugation. Um, so I think Mahatma Gandhi's famous slogan actually captures this struggle in which he said that, that India cannot be free until women are free and women cannot be free until India is free. So going back to Wolf, although she herself was not supportive of imperialism and her husband advocated self-governance for the people of Sri Lanka, for example, some of her work demonstrated a sense of white superiority as well, which can be quite difficult to read, particularly her diary entries. Um, and this has been highlighted by feminists of color. Um, and today the works of Gayatri Chakravoti Spivak, for example, especially her seminal work, Can the Subaltern Speak? Uh, speak volumes of the conscious and subconscious bias of feminism. Um, and you have colored feminists in particular calling for white supremacy to be excised from feminism. So I think there's a lot to unpack and also discuss as well when we talk about the contributions of um, Virginia Woolf and also her contemporaries. I hope I've answered your question. That was a really rich answer. Thank you so much, Rehan. I really enjoyed hearing those insights. Um, uh, I think we might ask Ben a question actually now. Um, we might bring in here not so much the perspective of a man perhaps, but the perspective of a student. Mm -hmm. so as a um, contemporary male student reader of this book, how do you identify with the arguments that she is presenting um, and what is it like for you to read um, A Room of One's Own? Yeah, I think, um, I mean, I'll, I'll try to speak as a student, but, um, you know, it's it's kind of hard to extricate that from my experiences as male as well. I think I first read of A Room of One's Own when I was in high school, so it's quite a while ago now. Um, and I think at the time, as it does now, Wolf's argument really resonated with me. Um, I probably didn't appreciate the intricacy of her metaphor as much as I did when I was rereading, but I think as a young man, and particularly as a student who's still learning about the world, and learning about relationships, there's definitely this experience of shock when you read Wolf and you start to become more aware of your privilege, um, particularly, you know, things that you've never had to step beyond taking for granted. Um, the thing which really struck me when I was younger, I think, is the extent to which there is all this writing that Wolf is musing on when she's in the library, which is denigrating and confining women to this particular space in society. Um, and I think I realise, you know, the contemporary equivalent of that is all of this media and social media commentary, which is effectively still saying the same thing in different words. Um, and you realise that actually not much has changed. This is a really compelling and current argument if you recontextualise it into the kind of um, the setting and language of the modern day. The other thing which really struck me was the extent to which the ability to create art is not just constrained by material circumstances, like not having a room or money. And obviously that's the focus of the text, but there's this idea of the, the whole web of relationships between men and women. So even when you do, you know, improve material circumstances this structure of society means that you know wolf is reading lady winchelsea and her contemporaries their ability to express themselves to express truth is filtered through their indignance and their frustration at their position and i think that was something that i'd really never consciously dwelled on it's just an obstruction that doesn't exist for me or my male friends you know people aren't speaking down to us implicitly in the same way so I think in that sense, um, you know, this is a book that can and should be appreciated by young male students as a comment on what we do have and what we live off that we're not grateful for. And that is still very, very current. Um, on rereading more recently for this panel, I think the more confronting realisation, um, which comes out of spending more time at university um, and learning about gender and learning about relationships, is that 
I am not a naive beneficiary of this injustice. I'm responsible. I have a role to play in pushing back against it. And I think when I was younger, I tried to separate myself kind of comfortably to read Wolf and sort of say, I'm on the writer's side, you know, I'm against these domineering men that she's talking about. But I think it takes probably more force of will and engagement to recognise that she's writing about me and that I can't separate myself from that. You know, I need to have to, I have to engage and recognise that if you don't engage, you're going to do harm. But if you do recognise and engage with it, maybe you can start to try and help. That's really fascinating, Ben. I like how you... um drew in this analogy of social media today and how the sort of constructs of today may, may be different, but the paradigm is in fact still the same and we mm. still have these challenges, but it's so heartening to hear your words of pushing back. So um, it's great that you're advocating for that and thank you. Um, I think it's probably really relevant um, to bring in Rosie again here because we're talking about the student experience and, and one of the issues for um, women's status, of course, is exclusion from education and training, which occurred considerably in the 19th century and beyond. Um, it's often cited as a key reason why women have not been able to contribute great works to the canon, whether it's art, literature, music, scholarship. Um, can you reflect on um, Wolfe's argument at the time as she poses it? And does it um, still resonate today? And are women's paths two leadership still blocked by similar types of obstacles? Yeah, it's a really um, interesting question. And when I was reflecting on it, I, um, I was thinking about, I actually work in the Virginia Woolf building at King's College London and Virginia studied at King's. And as, as um, Dame Quentin mentioned, um, you know, she wasn't allowed to pass with a, with a degree at that time. So she, she studied at King's, but she wasn't given her degree from King's College. But of course, now I work in a building which is named after her. And in the foyer, there is a wonderful piece of an art installation where Virginia, there's a, a life-size model of Virginia Woolf inside a wardrobe. And she's sitting on a chair scribbling. Um, and of course, the room of one's own in that depiction is a very small room of one's own. And I, I really love that. I, when I walk into the building, I'm always looking at that and thinking about it. And there are quotes from her work all over the walls. But of course, the university is reclaiming that legacy. At the time, they were not willing to give her a degree. And actually, if you walk along the street, um, a, 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 along King's College, um, the Strand, you'll see various women who've worked at King's over the years and have not been championed mentioned. One of them is Rosalind Franklin, who we all know was not put forward for the um, Nobel Prize, but actually was absolutely critical in discovering the X-ray. And one of the things that I thought when asked this question was, women did contribute to the canon throughout history. Um, as Rahan said, you know, women, Arabic women co contributed. We know that women um, were, were, were at their time, in the time were well-known artists, were well-known novelists. But what happens is they were not canonized. And I think that is the critical difference. There is this stereotype that persists today and remains a barrier for women today. You can do great work, but it will be thought of as good more often than brilliant. And there is a real danger that men are conceived as, as more often displaying real talent, real brilliance, whereas women are hardworking and, and, and doing more mediocre work. And so that, that is a significant barrier that we still need to overcome. And one of the things that I was reflecting on when, when I was looking at Virginia in the, in the wardrobe was this point about the, the room that one needs. And I was thinking about other women whose stories were not remembered, but perhaps we do remember them more. And I was thinking about the Bond Woman's Narrative, a novel written by an escaped slave in, in the United States called Hannah Crafts, which was only published in 2002. And so how women have been able to, to surmount these barriers over the years, but actually they haven't been given the critical acclaim that they deserved, except for the this, this, this small number of um, women that's mentioned at the beginning of um, A Room of One's Own. Um, it's much, much harder to reach that canonized status. And I think that continues. So that, that's my reflection on that question. Thank you, Rosie. And I think it leads into my question to Kate. Um, so, I mean, she's obviously Wolf's claiming that, that, that women, in order to create, do need to have the capital behind them. Um, and I wondered as a literature scholar, you know, what do you think about how we talk about money as one of the preconditions of creative work? You know, is it, as she says, necessary? And, and do we tend to kind of not want to think about that in re relation to creativity? It's a really 
complex question in lots of ways, I think, because on the one hand, I mean, we know, and certainly throughout the sort of history of the 20th century, we know that creative work can flourish in the most extraordinary, extraordinarily devastating of circumstances where far from having 500 pounds in a room of one's own, you know, um, poetry flow flourished in the concentration camps of the 20th century. But the essay is very emphatic about the importance of money, isn't it? It does return to it um, repeatedly, both in images it uses. There's that um, great image that I, I really enjoy of the kings and queens, and I think there's some magnates <laughs> and so on, um, coming to pour gold in the foundations of the, um, you know, the men's colleges at Oxbridge. Um, you know, as opposed to the women's and so on. And yet for the women, by contrast, the narrator's only asking 500 pounds and a room um, of her own. In a way, it's a fairly modest um, request. People are divided about how much money 500 pounds would be today, but something like in the realm of 20,000 a year. So, you know, reasonable, but, but it's a modest kind of request she's making. Um, but I think what's important to remember is that money, that money um, in this text and well, money throughout it, but that money in particular symbolises something much more than money itself. Um, her aunt's legacy, the narrator tells us, unveiled the sky to me. And I like this image of, and she relates it to kind of pushing Milton out of the way or some other man who would somehow block her creativity. Um, so it symbolises those material conditions that are necessary um, to art. But again and again, um, as often as there's the sort of <clears throat> argument about money itself, it's about it, and I'm going to quote her again because I love this, the freedom to think of things in themselves, the freedom to think of things in themselves. And as I read it, this time for, the, for this project, I think that captured for me something extra about the text's radical nature. It feels quite radical for me today to read that. Thinking of things in themselves seems to run counter, it seems to me, to actually so much of the discussion that we have about creative work today. Um, and I'd include, I mean, you asked as a literature scholar, um, you know, I'd include the sort of creative work of humanities um, scholarship more generally in that. So whether that's because we talk about developing a side hustle, which I have teenage children, I hear about side hustles, um, or monetizing our passions is another thing, you know, how to monetize your passion, um, or because we're used to thinking of things as needing to have a very kind of utilitarian or economic or, you know, um, at least somehow demonstrably productive end, that there's all these sorts of ways that we need to, um, that, we, that we talk about creative work um, within. Um, and so in 1929, Wolf's narrator already notes the world's notorious indifference to art and literature, and this isn't even about the women, it's about the men as well, the narrator says, it does not ask people, the world, does not ask people to write poems and novels and histories. It does not need them. Naturally, it will not pay for what it does not want. Now, this isn't a position that the text itself advocates um, or advances. This is an essay that's densely packed with literary illusion. It's thick with imagery, um, both intertextual uses imagery from the kind of um, well, canon and otherwise of, um, of at least British literature. Um, it kind of, you know, embeds within its own making a sort of significance for literature. And Wolfe, of course, understood literature as um, having a kind of powerful role to play in the public and political sphere that literature had to be connected, um, you know, to politics, to, to public life. Um, but it's not just literature that she addresses here, and I think this is what struck me this time um, reading too, is the advocacy not only for fiction, which she herself is writing, but for other kinds of humanities work. 
She asked her audience, that Imagine kind of group, um, or they started as a real group, the Imagine group of um, women at these um, women's colleges and including us, her future audience, to uncover that hidden literary tradition, the lost histories, to engage with understanding the effect of the human psyche of being sort of laughed at for wanting to pursue a particular profession or um, the effect of being continually told you're inferior and I think you know across the 20th and 21st century we've done a lot of that we know now about the vast range of um, military work that women produced in the early modern period um, when Wolf imagines it couldn't be done <laughs> um, but in part because of these injunctions I think um, made by Wolf and others to do so so in this sense the radical form of the text it's kind of unruliness its meandering path, um, which kind of mimics that sort of slow thought or that reflecting, um, I've lost the quote in front of me, but the freedom to think of things in themselves is actually something that, um, dare I say, even within a university, I think we sometimes lose now in the pace of other ways that we talk about money and creative work. Mm. Mm. Yeah, really interesting reflections. I'm, I'm going to stick a little bit, though, with the sort of, you know, idea of this material basis for um, being able to do certain kinds of work. And I, and I want to take that to you, Ben. So, you know, obviously we could apply some of these arguments, ir irrespective of gender, to the student experience. You know, um, access and inclusion at universities is very often dependent on socioeconomic status. And I wonder if you think as a society we've done enough um, since this time when Wolf wrote A Room of One's Own to actually break down those kind of obstacles and how they impact young people now who want to go to uni. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, the first thing to say is I'm probably not the best person to be talking about this just by virtue of my background and my good luck. Um, so I'm going to be speaking on behalf of people whose lived experience I don't have access to. Um, I'm not going to be speaking as precisely and truthfully here as someone else might be able to. Um, you know, I think if Alan Tudge was on this panel, he would probably point to the increased number of young people attending university. And he would say, you know, the majority of those young people are women. And he would leave it at that and he'd say, job well done. Um, but I don't think we can leave it at that. Um, in the same way, I think that the Dons at Cambridge would have pointed to Newnham and Girton and they would have said, there we go. You know, we've got women at university, job well done, and patted themselves on the back. And I don't think we can do that. Um, I think the fact is that we are seeing these numbers in spite of still enormous difficulties to young people getting access to tertiary education. I think, as you note, Fiona, on the axis of socioeconomic status, that's particularly pronounced. Um, and I think we're also seeing that even when you do get to university, young people have very, very different experiences and that, that produces inequalities that extend beyond just university. Um, I think, you know, if you just read Wolf, the mythical notion of university study is that you'll just drift across campus and read books and lunch with friends. Um, but for most young people nowadays, university is a really financially challenging time. Um, most people have to work incredibly hard to just make ends meet while also facing study and family responsibilities. And you just have to look at some of the ANU colleges. Um, a year's rent is not covered by the most generous scholarship the university awards. So either the university is pretending that people have money coming out of nowhere, or they are honestly acknowledging that only people who are externally supported can attend and study the amount that the ANU is prescribing. Um, and ANU is, you know, by no means the most expensive accommodation you can find at a university in Australia. So this is not a specific case. Um, university is still predominantly attended by wealthy metropolitan people. If you can even get to university, the quality of that experience varies massively depending on your background. And as I mentioned, you know, SES is a major dimension on which that depends. But if we if we go back to women, you know, in university, women are still not getting the same quality of education that I think young men are. Um, you just have to sit in on a tutorial, and I'm guilty of this, but men are speaking and engaging and dominating the conversation. And, you know, we have statistics on that, and there is experience of that. But you can't tell yourself that the same quality of education is accruing to all people um, not to mention if you are a person of colour or an Indigenous person or a queer person, um, there are again all these obstacles that interfere with this notion of a pure education. Um, and I think it's impossible to suggest, you know, even if you can point to statistics, you can't say that the same education is going to every student um, because of these built-in inequalities and that is propagating these. So this is why I feel, I think we were talking beforehand, one of Wolf's best images to me is this idea of the spiderweb 
on which Shakespeare's plays is suspended. So each of these aspects of university life that I'm talking about is snagging and tearing at that gossamer. And it makes it harder to get the same experience of education that I think Wolf is idealizing. Um, so while I think there certainly are more opportunities and for many people, university has been an extremely positive experience, even life-changing for some. I think that even compared to some times in the past, the current policy setting is making it harder for young people to get quality education, not easier. Thank you, Ben. I think there's an incredible um, set of powerful points in, in what you're saying. I don't think the vice chancellor is listening tonight, but I'm, I'm sure he'll listen later. <laughs> <laughs> I was going to say, I feel like we're all talking to the crowd, you know, we're all students here. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, no, no, excellent, excellent set of points there. And, and, it, and it really does extend that sort of um, set of issues that she's raising around uh, inequalities. And I think the cobweb is what we sometimes refer to now as micro inequities, you know, the little things that add up. Um, let me ask you another question, Raihan. Um, can you tell us a little bit about who the equivalent of Virginia Woolf might be in the areas that you study? Um, I think we know too little about who the great feminist writers are in non-Anglophone or non-European context. So, so I wondered whose work you would single out. Thanks, Fiona. Oh no, that's a very difficult question. Um, there are many great feminist writers in the Arab world. Um, the 19th and the 20th centuries witnessed the proliferation of women's literary culture in the Arab world with the establishment of women's periodicals, newspapers and journals, and the subject covered in these um, outlets differ depending on the circumstances of the country and societal limitations facing women. So many writers were influenced by the development in Europe, um, including the right to vote, uh, but were also aware of their own cultural and political circumstances, especially the colonial struggle. Um, over the years, I must say, um, Many amazing female writers addressed religious, political, and cultural issues facing women in the Arab world. But I, I have to choose, right? So I will nominate Nawal Sadawi, who passed away in March this year um, as one of the greatest feminist writers in the Arab world. Um, she was born in 1931. She was a feminist writer, a trained physician, an activist, psychiatrist. She wrote fiction and non-fiction, um, discussing patriarchy, abuse of religion to suppress women, female genital mutilation, class divides, and imperialism. Um, so she published a book um, in 1972 called Women and Sex, which was deemed controversial. Um, the book was banned in Egypt for more than two decades. She also lost her job at the Ministry um, of Health as a result. Uh, one of my favorite novels actually is called God Dies by the Nile. It narrates a story of a peasant woman uh, struggling against oppression, poverty, and patriarchy. Um, Zakia, who's the protagonist, refused to be powerless. Um, so again, going back to your question, Fiona, that um, as you've mentioned, um, we are looking at someone like Asadawi, and she's not very familiar, uh, not really um, known in Western circles, although she's a celebrated radical feminist in the Arab world, um, in her own words, she actually remarked and discussed this issue. She said, I have the quote here, um, the colonial capitalist powers are mainly English or French speaking. I am still ignored by big literary powers in the world because I write in Arabic and also because I am critical of the colonial capitalist, racist, patriarchal mindset of the superpowers. Um, so again, she herself was aware um, how she was not really, um, I think, addressed or appreciated in Western circles. Uh, but having said that, I will, I will be very quick. Having said that, um, she became quite controversial towards the end of her life because she supported the authoritarian government of Abdel Fattah al-Sisi, the current president of Egypt. But I would say that should not erase her work as a radical feminist who fought for women's equality in the Arab world. Yeah, wonderful. I have in mind a follow-up project. <laughs> um, let me, um, we'll, we'll move to questions and, and so forth in a moment. And I'd just like to remind the audience that if you'd like to ask a question, can you put it into the Q&A um, button down at the bottom? 
Um, and just while you're thinking of those questions, I just want to um, end this panel by just asking Lara, um, who, you know, really sort of dreamt up this project. Um, you know, you're a researcher in feminist art history. Um, why do you love A Room of One's Own so much? And, and what importance do you give it in, in the wider feminist conversation? Yeah, thank you, Fiona. And um, I really in, enjoyed um, Rayhan's commentary there, actually. Um, yes, yeah, so I see, um, I came to came back to A Room of One's Own because I, I'm researching the professionalisation of 19th century women artists between Britain and Australia. And it was 2019, I thought, oh, I really should just check in with Virginia Woolf's Room of One's Own to see what, what she's actually saying, because I think I can't remember properly. And that experience was very interesting because what she was saying was really mirroring what a lot of second wave feminist um, art historians were talking about in the 60s and 70s. So I see her very much as a bridge between these radical feminists who changed laws, changed institutions, um, opened the way for women to go to university, did things like um, ensure that the Married Women's Property Act was overturned, all these kinds of things. Um, and so Virginia Woolf sits between those 19th century feminists, who we call the first wave, um, and these 20th century later feminists, which we call the second wave, um, you know, being the Germaine Greers and the Linda Nochlins and Griselda Pollock, et cetera. And now we are living in what's, I guess, called the third wave. So I see her as this very important bridge that reminds us of this continuum, that these, these issues still percolate, they're still relevant, and um, they're still shockingly relevant, actually, which is surprising. Um, and it's sort of universal, her arguments across time. And in terms of the art world, I think everyone sort of jolted into shock this in this third wave, even though Linda Nochlin needed to jolt them into shock again in the 70s, um, that, in fact, many of our institutions, our national galleries and museums found themselves lacking. They discovered, you know, the National Gallery in London made a you know, whole social media cast about it that only 2% of our collection, and they only collect paintings, is by women. And that's sort of pretty crazy number, really, in many ways. And so they have been really working to try and um, to reverse that. And all the institutions all over the world are doing exactly the same thing. Um, and so that's sort of a really big shift that we are living through at the moment. Um, and things are starting to move. You know, the other week we probably you may remember seeing that Frida Kahlo's self-portrait um, sold for about 35 million US dollars. Now, that's the highest price of Latin American artwork has been sold for at a public auction, um, far outstripping Diego Rivera, who was considered the great, you know, um, patriarchal figure of Latin American art and, her, and of course, her, her partner. Um, and, in fact, a little portrait of Diego is in her head in the portrait, which is quite funny. Um, so there is this changes, but, you know, a contemporary women artists aren't experiencing that change. Their prices are still often lower than the prices um, for men. And so we come back to the words that... Um, Dame Quentin mentioned very interestingly um, about how we have to sort of keep working in sort of obscurity and poverty sometimes to keep, you know, keep going and keep pushing the messages forward. Um, and eventually we will get there. And Virginia Woolf says it in the last page of the book, in a hundred years' time, when we've worked away in all this poverty and obscurity, we are going to end up there. We're going to make it. We're going to change the world. Well, we're here now. We haven't changed the world. But we I think that if she was looking down today, she would see some green shoots that were very promising and she'd see some pretty dark disappointments as well um so it um i think that's why i loved i love the fact that that book is so alive her literary contribution brings this you know difficult sometimes dry polemical debate to life in such a colorful and nuanced fashion and that's why i think it endures really fantastic great answer lara and um in, uh, yeah, I mean, absolutely. Those things also struck me just working with this such contemporary re relevance and just so beautifully written and just full of surprises when you spend some time with it. It's, it's just a fascinating text. We've got a couple of comments more than questions in the Q&A. Um, someone's saying it's not just young people. And of course, that's absolutely right that, that those issues of access to education are much, much broader than that. Um, and someone asking um, you to repeat the name of the feminist Arab author again. Um, so you might want to type that in, Rohan, if you can, in the Q&A. Um, but look, while we're waiting for some more questions, um, I wanted to come back to Kate. And, and I was 
interested that you didn't mention the pandemic, the flu, the, the flu pandemic as sort of one of those sort of disruptive moments. Because of course, again, that seems an amazing analogy with the present times. And mm-hmm. and and I guess the sort of hopes that that many of us pin on this moment that it's a kind of, you know, that it's opened up possibilities that we didn't see before. Do you think that was a factor in the background of Virginia Woolf's um you know, that period you were describing the 20s as this modernist period? I think it could not be in the sense, I mean, I guess we're talking, so the flu is a little earlier. So I don't know, are we hoping that in 10 years' time or so we'll (laughs) feel more recovered (laughs) than we do now? Um, Look, I think it was partly because perhaps as, COVID has partly represented to us now the kind of psychological effect of the flu apart from so many dying was that feeling that um, you know the Victorian period was meant to be so much about progress um, and was in many ways we should you know (laughs) undermine that but that when confronted with this flu that science medicine sort of couldn't help them so there was a kind of psychological um, hit (laughs) I guess in that sense so um, yeah I don't know if it had I mean one of the things I think um, about COVID I I guess this is part of um, maybe Lara you're thinking about this during lockdown um, that many people today have experienced that sort of need for a room of their own (laughs) um that that's you know transformed our experience of space and so on I'm not sure that that would be quite transferable to the early 19th century experience of of the flu Mm -hmm. um no zoom for a start (laughs) sorry there was no zoom for a start no zoom (laughs) Um, and you know not so much space for most people probably not Virginia Woolf she probably had quite a bit of (laughs) <laughs> Thank you. Um, I just wondered, Quentin, do you have a question or a reflection um, for the panel? Uh, look, I, I've just uh, been so inspired by, by the discussion. Uh, the theme that shines through for me is, the well, the power of storytelling, uh, the significance of women's history, you know, uh, Rose talked about the uh, paucity of recognition of great women's achievements. Uh, but I, I so often find for myself in uh, women's history, the, the proud history of the women's movement in this country, around the world, uh, in the Arab world, of which I know much less, but I certainly do know some, including the names uh, mentioned, uh, but you know, we we uh, find our source of courage and support and inspiration in the stories, in the history, in the achievements to keep on going because there's a lot of work to be done, and so much of it in women's education uh, right now, and the education of the uh, our young people of all ages in uh, in Australia. I thought that. Uh, you know, Ben's advocacy uh, uh, for that was uh, very powerful. It's enormously important to me and to my generation who benefited uh, by so many opportunities that were opened up by us. We were always conscious of it, the women who worked so hard for us to get access to uh, enriching, enhancing uh, education, breaking down barriers. The, the most significant achievement of the women's movement, uh, I believe, is in, in education. It is the key to a fulfilling life in every aspect. Uh, and I, I uh, feel evangelical about the storytelling, about passing on the, the, the proud history, the traditions, um, the bonds that uh, women share around the world in every country uh, through that that, that shared history. Um, It it is what gives us the uh, energy and the commitment and the dedication to keep uh, 
working until we do have uh, true equality uh, of opportunity for women and we must never back away from that ambition. So mm -hmm. I'm, I'm very grateful to have had the opportunity to listen to uh, uh, this discussion and uh, feel part of it. I, mm -hmm. It seems certainly uplifted and inspired me. Uh, uh, my uh, uh, feminist pals, colleagues, we feel so uh, deeply uh, about our responsibility as we're going into our 80s of, of passing on uh, what we care about so, so deeply for our children and our grandchildren, no more than in our educational institutions. Mm. And so much of this um, text is about those legacies, isn't it? It's about how... Yeah, um, absolutely. And, and, you know, the, the remembering the sort of joy of reading Virginia Woolf and uh, thinking about the way that has been passed down to and what it means in our hearts and minds and the uh, experiences, uh, the work done by uh, feminist writers in the... Uh, Arab world, the the, uh, the influence, the importance mm. to mm. us today. Mm. Yeah, no, very important reflections. We have one question in the uh, Q and A, um, which goes back to some of Wolf's work and and asking whether some of her other writing reflects the main themes of Room of One's Own. Um, for instance, it's possible that there appear to be some elements of this in Mrs. Dalloway. Um, Kate, I think this is one for you. <laughs> Um, it depends which themes, <laughs> maybe. Um, but yes, of course, I think Wolf, um, particularly, I mean, particularly Mrs. Dalloway to the lighthouse, I'll put Orlando in a different category because it's quite wild. I don't know if you've read Orlando. Um, it's actually written as a kind of love letter to a woman that, um, she had a very sort of intimate relationship with and this woman sort of survives. It actually, oh, maybe maybe I won't take Orlando separately. Um, Orlando takes place across 500 years of history and um, she sort of changes gender throughout these different moments. It, it is kind of a wild story. I think students, it's been a long time since I've taught it now, but students are often quite surprised <laughs> to find it in the in the early um, 20th century. But it is about um, perhaps that community of storytelling among women or connection among women um, who, you know, um, and I, I think that is a theme that kind of carries across a number of her novels, including Mrs. Dalloway, even though it's so individualistic in many ways, um, but certainly to the lighthouse as well with the sort of shifting gender relations between um, Mr. and Mrs. Ramsey, the main couple. Um, you know, these are things that she takes through her fiction. Thank you, Kate. Um, does any, do any of the panellists have a question for someone else? I just thought I might add something just before we go on to that. Um, I don't know if the um, our guests have actually seen um, Rehan's answer to the question about the author that um, uh, the female author of the Middle East. And the, um, I just thought because the message only went to the hosts and the panelists. So I'm reading it here. It's Nawal Al Sad Sadawi. Is that right, Rehan? Which, if the person's still there, is N A W A L. And then the second um, surname is al dash s -A, a d a w i just in case you haven't been able to see that. Sorry to interrupt there. Yeah. I'm aware that we're actually running out of time. So I, I, I want to just end really with just with a reflection on that whole sort of um, idea of legacy that uh, you were talking about, Quentin. And, of course, I mean, you have been such a wonderful inspiration to, to so many of us um, and, and really have passed forward all of your achievements in that way through that kind of inspiration. And I do love the idea that we might, you know, complicate legacies by doing something very similar with uh, Nawal al Sadawi's work, you know, yeah. it'd be wonderful to have another sort of version of this as a follow-up. 
Um, and um, I'm sure Quentin will volunteer as a reader. <laughs> <laughs> on the spot. I would. <laughs> um, but uh, look, it's been a really wonderful discussion. Um, I'm sorry, we are almost out of time, so I won't take any more of the questions that are now popping up. Um, but look, because we know this discussion, we knew in advance it was going to be way too short. We're going to host by Zoom a, an informal online book club, um, which will be between six and seven next Tuesday. Um, so you can listen to the podcast and come back for some more conversation. Uh, we'll just keep the, the chat going. Um, so we're going to send an email to everyone who's registered for the launch and um, the details will be in that. So, so do feel free to, you know, do whatever you do at a book club, bring your wine and cheese <laughs> and, um, and the, the conversation can continue. Um, so, look, I do hope you'll all take the chance to listen to this, this podcast. It is absolutely beautiful. I'm so thrilled with how it turned out. And it's incredibly hard to know with a project like this how it's going to turn out. And, and I hope you'll agree that it's a, a really beautiful thing. Um, you can find it wherever you listen to uh, podcasts, just search for Reading the Room. And if it doesn't come up, use uh, inverted commas, Reading the Room. Um, and uh, when you get there, you'll see the beautiful um, artwork of Virginia Woolf's profile, which we saw um, at the beginning of this, um, which was designed by ANU uh, School of Art and Design students, Lara White and uh, Kate Rice. So congratulations to them on, on creating such a, a, a wonderful design. So thank you to everyone uh, for joining us this evening. Uh, really thank you, Rosie, for, for joining us from, from London. Very good of you to get up so early. And thank you so much, Quentin, for, for opening this um, event. And to all our panelists, really insightful comments. And it was a wonderful conversation to, to have with you all. Um, and thank you once again to all our readers. I personally found it an, an absolutely beautiful experience to just, um, my, my children don't let me read aloud to them anymore. So <laughs> reading, reading aloud was just a, a real pleasure to revisit. And, um, and I think uh, many people uh, said much the same thing. It was a wonderful thing to bring us all together from the rooms of our own into some kind of connection uh, during this, this last lockdown. So um, really appreciate that. Um, so it's been an enormous pleasure um, hosting you all this evening and uh, I hope you'll enjoy re listening to the podcast and uh, indeed enjoy the rest of your evening. Thank you, everybody.